from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan here to announce show number 44, recorded Wednesday, November 29th, 2006. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Codesmith Tools, makers of Codesmith, an extensible template-based code generator for .NET. Hansel Minutes listeners get $100 off Codesmith Professional with coupon code HM100, online at codesmithtools.com. Support is also provided by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine, online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott and Carl discuss Pro Audio Basics. Hi, this is Carl Franklin. You're listening to Hansel Minutes. I'm here with Scott Hanselman again. Hi, Scott. How are you, sir? And you're in Africa right now. Tanzania. You're not really. We're recording this ahead of time, but by the time the listener is listening, you'll be in Africa. I will. So for all intents and purposes, future Scott is in Tanzania. All right. Well, um, this is an interesting show that you proposed to me that uh, we do one on audio basics. Yeah. I mean, I know the basics of audio, so maybe this would be audio intermediates because when we first started talking about doing the show, you had made uh, a couple of suggestions about me getting certain bits of equipment. And I was like, oh, well, hey, I've got this this $20 USB microphone from Logitech. I'll just use that. Right. And then you said, oh, Scott, and you patted me on my head <laughs> condescendingly. There's so little that you know about sound. And I said, well, shoot, we, we, we've done 43, 44 shows now, and I still don't quite understand how you do it. So let's talk about audio. Well, first of all, let me just say that audio is like a movie, you know, and it's like video. It's everywhere, and it sounds good, and therefore people think easy. I you thought, know? I mean, I thought so. When you go to, when you just listen to the radio, it all sounds good. Every th- little thing they do sounds good. And so, you know, you, you, since it's so pervasive, you kind of get the misleading feeling that, uh, that it's easy to do. And, uh, it's a natural thing for people to just write off, oh, well, you get a microphone. Oh, you get some stuff. You put it together. It's easy. And, uh, you know, I think you were one of the first critics of the quality of podcasts out there. Yeah. Initially, I heard a lot of podcasts and it sounded like someone, been, somebody was sitting in the front, uh, seat of their car at a movie theater with, uh, you know, Sony portable microphone recording on a micro tape or micro cassette. I just sounded like someone was phoning it in and literally some of the podcasts are phoned in. Right. Um, I think that the .NET Rocks, you know, really sounded great. I think more and more people are learning how to make stuff sound better, and yeah. I think it's starting to show. But yeah, it's difficult to do a podcast out of your garage. It absolutely is. So, uh, you know, what I'm going to hopefully do here is just, to, you know, dispel a few myths and, you know, tell you a few things that you need to know. And we're going to start, Scott. With line level versus mic level signals, there are two actually voltages that uh, that are used when you're plugging in something to a computer or to a mixer or to any kind of audio device, and you really need to know the difference between two. Have you ever had this happen? You uh, plug something into your computer and record on it, and your recording sounds completely hosing distorted. Yeah, way, way, way louder than it is supposed to. Way louder than it's supposed to. And that's because what you've done is you've taken a line-level output, which is hot, 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 and you've plugged it into a mic input, which is low, 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 and expecting a very low signal. So does this have anything to do with when I plug my iPod into... uh into my into my tape deck adapter, I have to adjust the volume on my iPod. That's right, because your tape deck adapter expects a microphone, which is putting out very low signal. And so the 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 hack, as you have figured out, is to turn the vo- record volume way down. But when you do that, you're not utilizing the amplifier, the recording amplifier, to its full potential. Ah. So, and that brings me to another thing, which is the difference between an amplifier and a resistor. Whenever you had any, any kind of fader, you know, like a fader, a button, a dial, a knob, a turn up, a turn down, it can either be a resistor, which means that at full volume, there's it's the completely normal, natural, full signal, sweet and light and crude and all that. No problem. Okay. When you pull it down, it's actually resisting. It's actually reducing the input. Whereas w- an amplifier, you start in the middle somewhere, 
and you pull, pull it up to amplify the signal. So those are two different things that you can think of as ways to control audio. Okay. There's a really good uh, explanation of line level versus mic level at shrinkster.com slash KDI. And there's a layman's explanation, you know, what plugs go where. And then there's also a more detailed explanation for geeks like us. Cool. Um, basically, microphones that uh, are dynamic microphones. Uh, well, all microphones that are good are low impedance. They're mic okay, so level. What's impedance? Impedance, as it sounds, is uh, resistance. It's impedance to, of the signal. And so uh, it's kind of backwards. Low impedance is a lower signal, and high impedance is a hotter signal. Okay. So and I want a. You said I want a low impedance microphone. Well, yeah, microphones that you plug in with XLR connectors are low impedance. They're balanced uh, audio, and there's a really discussion, a uh, really good discussion of balanced versus unbalanced audio at shrinkster.com kdh. Uh, so, so let me ask you this: If I take a regular microphone, like back in the day, we used to do radio. I mean, we all did radio shows as a kid, right? You take a tape player, you get a you know get this classic little black plastic Radio Shack microphone. Mm-hmm. When I plug that one eighth inch uh, plug into the little tape deck, what kind of microphone is that, and what kind of signal is happening over that? That's uh, a high impedance. Yeah, okay, so that's a high impedance microphone. Is that high impedance because it's an inexpensive Because it's microphone? unbalanced, basically. And unbalanced, um, unbalanced connectors are used primarily for instruments and for short cables. Uh, and because the wires are typically not, um, uh, well, they, they are shielded, you know, like shielded cable. But the, since they're, they're just two wires, there's a positive and a negative, right? Mm-hmm. A balanced line has a positive, a negative, and another wire. And basically, it does a differential between the, it sends the signal down on two wires plus the ground and does a differential between them. So it balances it out. Ah. It's like a nice complete circuit. And if you're going to have a long cable and long instrument cable, long quarter inch cable, whatever it is, especially at line level signals, you need, to have uh, balanced, uh, balanced systems, and not only does it and balanced cables you can think of as stereo cables, like a stereo quarter inch has the two bands mm-hmm. around it, uh, and an XLR cable is also three prongs and it's balanced. So, so the cable that I'm talking on has has two two wires inside, but it's not yep. recording mm-hmm. me in stereo. It's tip ring. That's it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mono, and also unbalanced. So a lot of uh, Armchair audio enthusiasts who like to do use mixers and stuff are probably using unbalanced connections for everything just because you have short cables. There doesn't seem to be a problem, but one of the manifestations of unbalanced systems is hum. So uh, if you have a lot of, uh, you know, patch cables and connections ah. going to a lot of different places and you have a lot of electrical system you know a lot of electrical devices that are all plugging into the same circuits you can have ground loops and you can have hum that goes through those uh connectors so i found when i was hooking up my home stereo uh and this may seem obvious to you and our listeners but it was not obvious to me immediately that when i ran my very inexpensive speaker wire over the power adapter the power brick uh, it sounded really bad. Bzzz. Yeah, exactly. 60 cycle hum. Okay. Yeah. So uh, they have hum eliminators, but it's best to just use ba- un, uh, to use balanced cables and balanced inputs. And it typically means if you have a balanced uh, input or output on a mixer or something like that, you're going to be sending data at a hotter level, plus four. It's called. Okay. So if I now if I. Uh Talk to me about equipment. I mean, when I go to the audio store, I assume I would go to the uh, the music store to buy this stuff. Well, actually, you'd go online. Um, there, you can go to a music store, but typically they stock things that are more for uh, musicians, that kind of stuff. And if not a lot of music stores have studio gear, of course, you know, the big ones like Sam Ash and Sweetwater Sound and uh, even Caruso Music here in New London does a lot of mail order, but... Um, but there are good places online, and I'm going to bring you to some of those links where you can see some of this stuff. Okay, fantastic. Um, also, I really want to mention one of my mentors in life, uh, Ethan Weiner, who uh, not only started Crescent Software back before Visual Basic and, and uh, .NET 
way before .NET. And, uh, but he also is a serious, serious audiophile. He built studio, he, he built studios and synthesizers in the seventies, mixing desks and things like that for fun. And, uh, you can check out his, uh, website at, uh, ethanweiner.com. Check out shrinkster.com slash, uh, KD4 for his sort of index to all of his audio articles. And he's written a lot of great stuff, including uh, if you go to shrinkster.com slash KD5, it's called Dispelling Audio Myths, Dispelling Popular Audio Myths. And this guy really knows what he's talking about. And unfortunately, um, some of his myths include stuff like, uh, you know, this product is no good. This product is, uh, you know, not necessary. This kind of stuff is not necessary, and and he doesn't get a lot of mainstream publication that way. Ah, uh, you know, because the sponsors, the yeah, the well, the sponsors that and the advertisers in those magazines are the basically he's writing articles saying don't buy them, you don't need them. Um, so you know you can agree or disagree with him, but he does have a he does have a lot of experience to back up his claims. So here's one: even though people cannot hear frequencies above twenty k. It is important that audio equipment be able to reproduce higher frequencies to maintain clarity. That's a myth. Mm. So most people don't hear above 20K. 20 kilohertz. 20 kilohertz. Right. So, uh, and, and he has demonstrations. Uh, he has some really cool demonstrations to demonstrate this, if I could say that. So you're saying that we should or should not include the sound above those areas? Well, I mean, you certainly can, but... It it really doesn't isn't going to do a lot for you. Now I know a lot of people say that they don't like to buy uh, MP3s. They don't like to buy music like AACs off of um, iTunes with lossy compression because that's they feel different. like they're buying broken sound. Well, that's different. Um, compression schemes do degrade sound, and if you really want to talk about digital versus analog, you got to talk raw wave. You know what happens in a in an analog signal is that this magnetic storage media stores the sound waves, which actually re get reproduced electrically um, through the you know analog tape device or, or records or you know records use grooves, etc. But it's the same analog uh, thing. With digital, it all depends on analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters. And uh, the analog to digital converters of the day. And going both ways, you know, when digital audio first came out and mass weren't that good. The very first CD players, uh, you know, they cut corners on the, uh, you know, the the ADCs and DACs so that they could get them out at a decent price. Uh -huh. And so they really weren't good. So the first ones to hit the stores were the ones that people were viewing. And there was this, you know, they don't sound good. Well, a lot of it was because they were crappy converters. The first ADAT, which is an uh, Alesis 8-track digital audio recorder that uses videotapes. It was revolutionary for studios because they had these, they could do away with their big Studer 8-track machines and just get this digital tape. But these ADATs, the very first ones, had absolute crap for audio to digital converters, analog to digital and digital to analog. And they didn't sound good. If you started mixing a lot of high frequencies, it had just turned to mush. It'd just go... Pfft. And so there began the sentiment out there that, you know, digital sounds crappy. Uh, and since then, the, the digital to analog and analog digital converters you get in a sound blaster now that come actually on a motherboard are like a hundred times better than those first ones that everybody formed their opinions on. So it's a non-issue. It's a non-issue. So here's another one of his myths. He says, digital audio sounds worse than analog, and the lack of digital's fidelity is revealed as a sterile and harsh sound that lacks warmth, depth, imaging, clarity, and any number of other vague and elusive descriptions. The fact, he says, is that analog tape compresses dynamics and adds distortion, which can be a pleasing effect for many people, including me. But for pure faithfulness to the original sound, modern pro-quality digital wins hands down every time. It is true that when digital audio is recorded at too low a level, the result can sound grainy. This distortion is is in addition to hiss that an analog recording also has, and it is caused by using an insufficient number of bits. 
That is, recording at too low a level on a 16-bit system is similar to recording at a normal level on an 8-bit system. So that's a lot of information. Put it into concrete things for, for our listeners in the context of things like CDs and things that we understand, like MP3s. Sure. So, so CDs are, are not compressed. They're pure 16-bit uh, digital reproductions. The analog-to-digital converters that get used to create those CDs are pro-quality. Um, if you play those back on any CD player of the day, it sounds as good as good can be. I mean, it's a... Uh, so why were there a lot of... I mean, I remember back in the day when CD players came out, uh, you could buy like a $200 CD player and then a $1,000 CD player. And even today, you can still do that. Yeah, the $1,000 ones basically have... There were some uh, features called oversampling that was supposed to... Uh, you know, sort of fill in the cracks between the bits, if you will. If you think of a wave, an analog sine wave, right? It's pure. It's it's calculus. It's just smooth. It's there. There are no steps to it. But when you digitize, what you're doing is you're taking a sample of audio, forty-four point one thousand times per second. A snapshot a in a moment in time. A snapshot in a moment in time which is a number. It's a number of amplitude. It's a volume. Okay. And when you look at that volume and you start zooming in on that wave, you begin to see steps. And if those steps are too, uh, you know, what am I trying to say? If the resolution is too low, if the resolution is too low, then, y you know, you can almost hear a zipper effect going from step to step. Ah. Right? But the... Uh, modern digital the analog converters just don't have this problem. So a $20 uh, CD player from Walmart will do just fine? In this day and age, absolutely. Anything that you can possibly pick up and buy is going to be great. So that's on the playback side, and but on the recording side, what are we recording on right now? Like, What am I looking at um, that I'm recording on? Because well, I'm in Oregon here. Yeah, what we're recording is pure 44.1 mono signals. Now, what we're using is uh, a microphone. The microphone I'm using is a uh, Audio-Technica 4040. You can read about that at shrinkster.com KDB. It's about 300 bucks, and it's a condenser microphone. Condenser microphones, uh, large diaphragm condenser microphones require power because they're so delicate and they're so uh, sensitive they, they require power in order to get the signal uh, amplified enough so that it becomes microphone level. And so when that microphone is uh, introduced through the phantom power, then it goes into a preamp, which amplifies it, and that preamp turns it into a line-level signal. What, what is a preamp? I know that... Uh they're always trying to sell me a preamp when I go to, you know, Magnolia Hi-Fi. Sure. What is a preamp and why would a, an audiophile want a preamp and not just a receiver with all that stuff built in? Well, there's two different things we're talking about. Preamps um, color the sound. A preamp gives you the characteristics of the sound. It's the first thing in the signal chain that actually amplifies and therefore colors the sound. So it comes out of it comes into the microphone and directly into the preamp. The microphone is mic level. Okay. The preamp turns it into line level. Ah. So, and, and, and when you amplify, you introduce noise, and therefore, preamps must be clean, and, uh, you know, some of them have a nice warming effect. Uh, if you use a tube preamp, uh, you know, preamp with a tube in it, you get that nice tube distortion, that John Lennon revolution sound to the voice that's, uh, that comes, a, a little natural distortion sounds good. But to tell you the truth, any preamp that you can get on any Mackie mixer these days is going to be more than adequate, especially for just spoken voice for podcasts. Okay. But even so, the preamp business is a boutique business. And there are companies out there that sell handcrafted German engineered preamps, you know, for $4,000 for a single channel. And it's beyond me why, you know, why you'd need this. I mean, they're, granted, I don't go around listening to them and A-Bing them, but um, I got a feeling that if you put, you know, uh, even a decent preamp like a Presonus Digimax, which is what we're using, against a, you know, a $4,001 preamp, all, all other things being equal, I'm not so sure that your average schmo could tell the difference. 
Well, I'm your average schmo, and what am I talking on here? This is a Behringer microphone. What kind of microphone yeah. is this I've got? You have a Behringer B2. Okay. That was about 100 bucks, wasn't it? Yeah, about 100 bucks. and the $100 version of the AT4040 is the AT2020, which you can get at KDC, shrinkster.com, KDC. Okay, so I've got a very nice-looking $100 microphone, big, thick cable that goes into a Marantz solid-state recorder. Tell me about this. The Marantz solid-state recorder you can find at shrinkster.com slash KDA. And uh, you're using, this is how we do the podcast, by the way, if people don't know. Scott is in Oregon. He's in Portland. And uh, he's talking on a phone. You have a headset. Right. I've got a phone in my left ear here. And actually, another phone just rang. Yep. I'm, I've got a, a headset. So you and I are just actually communicating over the phone. Right. We're communicating over the phone. But the phone's not being recorded. It's just there to talk. Right. You're also talking into a microphone, which is being recorded on this digital audio recorder. Exactly. That turns into a wave file, which then you're going to send to me uh, via FTP when we're done. And more on that in a second, because that brings up flack. Um and I'm talking into a microphone in a sound booth here, and that microphone is going into a, a Presonus Digimax preamp unit, which is just a nice preamp. That is going into a audio interface, which uh, in our studio here is a Mark of the Unicorn 24IO, which you can see at KDD. We like this because it has 24 inputs and 24 outputs and a firewire cable to your PC. And boom, you've got a lot of I.O. So I'm one of the inputs, and you're one of the inputs. Well, not yet. Now, what we do is we have two of those inputs going out to two different phone lines. And how we do that is through a telephone interface called a Telos 1, which you can look at at uh, shrinkster.com KDK. Telos 1 is, uh, we actually have a 1 plus 1, which is uh, two of these things together. So you can have two people on the phone with no crosstalk. And that's basically what its job is, to separate the caller on the other end of the phone from whatever signal you're sending when you talk on the phone. Uh, so when .NET Rocks does an interview and you're talking to someone, their phone channel is coming into that system and then becomes one of the channels. That's right. And then we can record it like a channel. And we don't get any of the um, signal that we're sending. Like my microphone is being sent down this same phone line, but it's not coming through on the track. Okay, that makes sense. Now, we've tried a lot of other ones, uh, particularly the JK Audio uh, digital hybrids, and they just didn't sound good. You can hear them in the early days of .NET Rocks. You can, every once in a while, you'll hear two people talk over each other, and you'll hear this buzzing sound, and that's basically because we couldn't, you know, we had two people on the same phone line. We had to put the schmutz in there. What's a good way for a garage podcaster to record... Uh, phone conversations. There really isn't any better way than using the Telos One. And what I mean by that is uh, there are other digital hybrids, but they're going to sound like ass. What about um, voice over IP solutions? So this is a good question. Uh, voice over IP like Skype, I think is really good for um, s you know taking the place of telephones when you want to call mom or you want to call someone or have a casual conversation. But if we're counting on quality and we're counting on, uh, you know, no, no noises in the middle of your talking, you really can't count on it because you're using the public Internet. And when you're using the public Internet, you know, if somebody starts downloading the Super Bowl, your neighbor or something, you, you know, you, you might have a timeout or something like that. And it ends up sounding like this. Wow. Right. So speaking of sound quality, your sound almost always sounds better than mine because you're in a booth, you've got a better mic, better equipment. I'm here with this Marantz recording onto a compact flash, Yeah. but I'm in a square-shaped room with a, an air conditioner going in the background. That's right. So you have two things going bad for you. You're in a square-shaped room with no sound absorption material, Right. and that means that if your walls are parallel, the sound bounces back and forth until it degrades, ah. and so you get an echo, and you sound like you're in your bathroom. Even if you're in a large room, if you have parallel walls, you're going to have that reflection problem. Okay. That's why when you go into a stone church with parallel walls and you clap, you hear it forever because that stone just reflects, 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 and uh, it just bounces back and forth, and it, that's where reverb comes from, basically. Now, how do you remove these background sounds that are going on here as the uh, you know people in the next office move a chair and... Uh and the the, un, the kind of ongoing low hum of the air conditioning. 
Well, it's not. It is. It's very easy to remove any kind of uh, low, uh, steady, consistent noise with noise reduction techniques, which I'll talk about in a minute. But um, what's more difficult is transients. Anything that's like somebody says "whoa" or "hey" or, or dog bark or, or you know something that uh, isn't continuous. Okay. Those things you just have to pretty much live with. Um, and that's why we have booths here because we're in a noisy city and, you know, cars honk and people play music and, you know, all sorts of things happen. So completing the, the cycle here, my, my Behringer microphone goes through this uh, f- uh, fancy cable into my Marantz solid yep. state recorder at 44.1 kilohertz onto a flash disk. I put the flash disk. Well, not in. so fast. Not oh, so fast. There's more. Yeah. You, when you plug your microphone in, since it's a condenser microphone, you need phantom power. Okay. And the What's phantom, that? phantom power is uh, power that's there when it's required for microphones and not there when it's not required. And that's why it's called phantom. Now, is that why my, my, my Marantz uh, drains battery so quickly? That's right. If you didn't need that 48 volts of power, you were using a dynamic microphone like a Shure SM58 or something like that then uh, you wouldn't be taking up quite so much battery. Because uh, I can drain four double A's in this thing in an hour. Yep. It sucks power. So that uh, phantom power uh, boosts the signal for the microphone at the microphone, and then uh, it goes into your preamp and you turn up the volume. Um, here's something. When you're setting volume levels, this is perhaps the most important thing. In the old days of analog, you wanted to set it so that it goes just a little bit into the red. You remember your old tape decks when you're recording from an album? Right. You would would bounce up against the red. So it bounces up against the red. Well, in the digital world, that's bad. You don't want to be anywhere near clipping. Uh Because analog distortion sounds nice and warm and fuzzy. Digital distortion sounds like... So you really don't want any. So as soon as you overdrive, that's what that's called, overdriving? Yeah, if you overdrive, you're done for. Now, now I, I had done that when I did some interviews at TechEd. I went into a noisy bar that's and right. brought him back. And you said, I can't use this audio because the it's just it's just a loud, loud it's so signal. so bad, yeah. Now, the software that we use, uh, Adobe Audition, which you can see at shrinkster.com KDF, this software has tool rest, you know, audio restoration stuff built into it. And I'll Mm -hmm. explain what it does. One of them is clip restoration. So if you actually do spike up above zero and you clip, you can tell it to reduce the the volume and restore the the wave. And what it does is it looks at the curve of the, you got to think of an arc, right? A parabola. Ah, I see. I get where you're going. I know you're going with this. It goes up, hits hits the level, and then flattens out. It flattens it out. pulls the whole curve down and extrapolates it. Exactly. It figures out how many points are up there and then use Bezier transforms to, to sort of reconstruct them. And it is amazing. If you don't, if your clipping isn't too bad, it's amazing. In your case, you overdrove the preamp at the source. So the preamp is analog, right? Before right. it got digitized, it was... It was hosed, and that's why we couldn't restore ah, it. Ah, the source, the, the source source was bad. Now it was just there was no information to recover. Now sometimes we've been able to do that if we in in there's a little trick that we figured out. Jeff and I figured this out that if you um, boost the input above zero, the clipped input above zero, so it goes way above zero, and then try to do clip restoration, the restoration will actually sometimes figure it out but it's not perfect, and sometimes you'll get a pop or a big gash of noise, and it's not perfect. But we have used that on occasion when the source audio has been clipped. So we'll talk about software in a second, but I I take this WAV file and I flack it. Yeah. Why is flacking so important for what you and I do? Flack is free lossless audio codec, and you can think of it like zip for WAV files. Lossless meaning it doesn't compress like MP3s do. Uh, it, but it does compress the data. It's just that when you unflack, it will decompress it into its exact replica state. Of, so it's so it's a so much it's superior way of zipping up wave files without losing any of the actual sound. It's right. lossless wave compression. Yeah, and Microsoft now has their own lossless uh, Windows Media Audio lossless codec. But uh, what's good, what's bad about it is that you only get about fifty percent compression. Just about as much as you would if you took a zip 
you know, put it in WinZip, a, a wave file, and put it in WinZip. So probably probably more than that, but um, well, you like get the I just idea. had a hundred and twenty meg wave file from another show, and it turned into sixty three megs, just about exactly half. Yeah. So what's good about that is uh, you can then send that up to you know FTP that somewhere, and it takes half the time as it, the wave would take, and there's no de- degradation. So why would I use this signal. over Zip? If you said that Zip gets you about fifty percent as well. Well, Zip got you fifty percent for eight bit files. For sixteen bit files, it's much less. I see. So it's better than Zip. Okay. But uh, but then you send it to me, and then uh, I'm recording your phone track through the Telos. And I'm also recording my microphone track uh, onto two different tracks. I take your audio wave file and I line that up to you on the phone track just visually. I mean, I can zoom in at a sample level and I can lock it in so when I play them together, I hear one voice. And then I just mute out the uh, ah. mute out the phone track and do a little panning, of course. You know, what we do here is we do a process on our audio files which starts with um, maximizing the volume, so we do a hard limit to bring up the peaks and slam the peak, slam the big peaks down a little bit, but bring it up so that most of it fits within the full spectrum. So is that taking advantage of the? Is that taking advantage of? Is that making it so you know I held my mic this distance away, you held your mic that distance away, and we sound like we're at different volumes. So yes, and normalizing not, the volume for exactly. Everyone? We're normalizing the volume, and not only that, but we're making it so that uh, it's uh, you can, analogous to saturating the tape. I mean, we're getting the signal hot, trying to get as much information out of it as you can. Yeah, and getting the signal hot is important, especially for the final mix, because a lot of people listen to these things on iPods with crappy headphone amplifiers, uh-huh. and so if you're listening in a loud environment and you've got a very soft podcast, then you're turning, you're cranking up and hearing more noise. From your uh, from your iPod or whatever your stereo system is, with all due respect to. to our listeners with crappy headphones, yeah, or or if you're listening at home on a stereo, you know, and it's very low, what do you do? You turn the volume up on your stereo and you hear more <laughs> in the background. It sounds like you know, you know what? Ah, so, so we, what so about free software? That Adobe software sounds pretty expensive. Well, let me get back to the process here. The next thing we do is we do noise reduction. Which uh, is a great, you can think of it like a multi-band noise gate, if you know what that means. Nope. But uh, with thousands and thousands of bands. What is a multi-band noise gate? Well, lost I don't want to go into that. <laughs> but basically, you, what it does is it effectively removes background noise while maintaining the signal that isn't noise. So the first thing you do is you find the quietest passage you can when you only have the background ambient sound, and that's why we take a you know a second, a few seconds at the beginning of the show to uh, take a noise profile. We were quiet for five seconds or so. What we do is then we go back in there, we select it, and we tell the software this is noise. And then you know we set a few magic settings, which is the key to making this stuff work that we've tweaked over the years. And we select the entire file and say now remove it. So we'd actually note I mean, that that's a part of the software. You can actually say this chunk here from zero seconds to five seconds, that was that was quiet. That's what this we is, think is quiet. This is the background ambient noise that I now want you to remove from the rest of the file to keep everything else. And it does it. And, you know, I say tweaking because if you have too low a number, you're going to have artifacting. And if you have artifacting, meaning like bad sounding MP3s, they sound phased and flanged and all that kind so of So an artifact stuff. in in MP3 world is just like an artifact in JPEG. It's an yeah. undesirable nice. uh, side effect. Exactly. Undesirable side effect. Perfect. So, it, But if you have too high a number, you won't get enough noise reduction. Um, so so it's a delicate balance thing. We, we think we have, you know, the magic numbers that we come up with to make it good. And we sometimes we'll go through a second time with a different number depending on how noisy the stuff is. So that's how we take out your room air conditioner and things like that. Then once we have those two things done, we uh, you know pan them and we go through second by second and listen to it. And we take out, uh, you know, if you, while you're listening, you went or something like that, we'll go and take that out. And I hope... I hope that Lawrence is listening to the show while he's And doesn't actually it. take that he out. He doesn't actually take out that sniff, yeah. So this is what I call removing the ums when people yeah. say, well, God, where's all the work? And it's like, well, it's not only all of the cleaning of the sound, but it's also removing uh, ridiculous 
pauses. Exactly, exactly. So um, the other, th- the last thing I want to end on here is, uh, is 24-bit recording really better? If you go to shrinkster.com slash KD7, uh, Ethan Weiner talks about 24-bit versus 16-bit. This is the sample size, right? This is the sample, the size of the sample that you're pulling out and saying, for every sample I'm reading, this is how many bits it's got. Well, I remember when I switched from 16-bit color on my monitor to 24-bit and then to 32-bit, it got better. So isn't more bits always better? Not necessarily. I mean, it all depends on, see, our eyes are more, are different, have different sensitivity number-wise than our ears do. And this is what it's all about. The bit rate in colors is how many colors you can uh, see. And our eyes are ab- absolutely wicked sensitive when it comes to shades of colors. Oh, hang on. Sorry, somebody just like flushed the toilet. So there was what do you call what do you call that an outlier? Yeah, have you lower, like, have Lawrence leave that in so you can hear what what that would sound like if you didn't remove it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're saying that our our eyes are much more sensitive, so it's more important within within with the ears. Well, and in terms of number of colors, right? Um, you know, the the number of colors doesn't re- doesn't equate to number of uh, samples per second okay. that you hear. You know, it's not it's similar in that they're both resolution, but the numbers aren't necessarily one to one. So, um, 24 bit systems. Uh, w- basically, Ethan's manifesto is that you know once we perfected the 16 bit digital to audio converter and vice versa, the music industry is pretty much done because you know it's perfect, and now you can see them inventing things that, uh, you know, inventing markets for themselves to sort of carve out a niche and buy our stuff because this is better. Oh, 24 bit. Well, you've just brought up a very profound thing. I mean, we know technology is getting faster, computers are getting faster, monitors are getting bigger, more dots per inch. You said that you're saying basically that audio has pretty much got it right. And that, you know, you could go and get a super audio CD or DVD audio, but only the most niche sensitive individuals will be able to really appreciate that. Yeah, and he's saying that nobody can appreciate it, that it's humanly impossible unless you're some kind of freak of nature that you have, you know, ears above. The uh, so 24 bit is the um state of the art in terms of, you know, resolution, uh in terms of sample size and 96k is what they're saying uh, people should be recording at now for ultimate quality. So it's 96 kilohertz as opposed to 44.1 kilohertz. That's right. Instead of 44.1 thousand uh, samples per second, we want to take 96,000 samples per second. And anything more would be superfluous. Right. So Ethan has a bunch of uh, tests up here. He's got a... Uh, first of all, he's got this myths thing at KD5, shrinkster.com, KD5. At shrinkster.com, KD6, he sort of, uh, for Skeptic Magazine, wrote this article called Audio Foolery, which is interesting as well. And the one other thing is he's got at shrinkster.com slash KD7 a test where you can actually listen to the same recording that has been encoded with different bit rates to see if you can tell the difference. Yeah, and, I gotta uh, check this out. And that's cool. So that's at shrinkster.com KD7. Now, here's something about 96K. Roger Nichols, who was the, uh, who is Steely Dan's engineer, all right? He is the god of audio. Steely Dan is the god of audio? Well, Steely Dan is a band, of course, that is well known in all recording as producing pristine perfect cds okay and records even before cds like the album asia sounds so good as the best sounding vinyl i've ha- i have okay and it's used as reference you know these these albums are used as reference albums in studios everywhere so roger nichols is no slouch okay okay so he uh wrote uh, he has a blog uh which and he wrote this post that was going on 96k is it better uh, at shrinkster.com slash KD8. And here's what he says. The two against nature CD was mixed 24 bit 44.1K to a master link through Apogee PSX 100. The PSX was feeding other units besides the master link for backup. We did 90, we did 24 bit 96K, but we couldn't hear any difference. Okay. Scott Hull mastered it from the 24 bit 44.1 files. In Sonic Solutions. Wow. 
So, so they did a simultaneous mix in 96K and in 44.1, and nobody in the studio, not even Roger Nichols, could tell the difference between the two. Wow. So it really begs the question, is this necessary, or is this, you know, the the uh, audio companies that are suddenly like, hey, if it's perfect, why why are we here, you know? Well, that's a very good question. And what's, what's next? What's you know, next? A hundred years from now, will it be the same? Right. So I'm not saying I believe all this stuff in terms of... You sound kind you of know, like a fanboy. You like this guy. I, I, yeah. I mean, I like it when people come out and make these kinds of claims and when guys like Roger Nichols say that kind of stuff because it just makes you think about, you know, is monster cable really necessary? This kind of stuff. You know, there's a question. If it, to, to, in, in the interest of not wasting our uh, listeners' times, which is always the theme of Hansel Minutes, we always try to give them at least one bit of information that they can use that day, because the assumption is you're listening to this while you're driving to work, and people may say, wow, this is all very interesting. I learned about audio, things I don't know, but mm. should I really buy a $100 monster cable? Well, the answer is, you know, if there aren't any other really good quality cables in the store, yes. <laughs> but but the fact is, is that the same quality cable can be found, you know, at uh, Radio Shack for, you know, about a third of the price. So I don't need 24 karat gold coated, super thick audio cables. No, no. And that's one of the myths that uh, Ethan dispels in his in his article. And it's even better with optical, right? One optical cable is no different than another optical Absolutely. cable. Absolutely. It's friggin' light, you know? <laughs> we move light better. Does the light move? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and digital cables, even better. DVI, right? Digital monitor cables. Gold-plated? Why? <laughs> you either get the bit or you don't get the bit, right? Uh, that's, that's tough. People swear by them, though. You never know, right? Yeah, it looks better. It looks better. That <laughs> bit looks more one than it the other bit. It looks better because I paid more for it. Well, I think that this has uh, been very, very interesting. This is is interesting to me because I don't have to know this stuff. I know yeah. more now than I did before we started, but I'm glad that you're running the sound audio quality and not uh, and not me on Hansel Minutes. Well, you know, I didn't want to sound like it's an ad for Pop Productions because, you know, we're obviously trying to convince people that... It's worth it to do things right. But, uh, you know, uh, it, it is a lot of information that anybody who's doing any kind of audio can use. And I hope I hope you learned a lot from it, too, dear listener. Well, I appreciate it. And I think because you did most of the talking on this show, it's my turn to say that uh, we thank you for listening. And we'll see you next week on Hansel Minutes. Hansel Minutes.